Hello and welcome to Media Monitor on the SABC News Channel. Independent and impartial. Now this is where we take a look inside the world of media, analysing the trends, the issues and the reporting of some of the week's top stories. I'm Peter Ndoro and this is what's coming up on the show today. We'll be unpacking the 36-page State of Broadcasting Industry Report. It looks at 25 years of freedom in broadcasting. And the report focused on several areas, such as how listeners are accessing content, advertising, TV and radio revenue. Now, do you ever check the authenticity of the pictures or videos that you see on social media before you share them? We spotlight how uh, fake stories and images have circulated in the midst of the recent attacks on shops owned by foreign nationals in South Africa. And for our regular features, an update from a country in Africa. And this week's international editor is from Zimbabwe. And we take a look at how the passing of former Zimbabwean President Robert Mugabe is being told in the country. We also take you back in history for one of our biggest stories of 1998. And that's a story that takes us to neighboring Lesotho. Can you remember what that story was? We'll find out a little bit later on in the show. Please don't forget to also to engage with us on social media. Uh, please use the Twitter platform with hashtag SABC Media Monitor. We'd love to hear what your thoughts are on anything that you hear, uh, hear on, see on the program. But first, let's take a look at uh, what's on the front pages of the Sunday papers this morning. And we start with the Sunday Times. And this paper is leading with the revelations that the post office knew for more than a year that Uyine Khrechana's self-confessed killer was a convicted criminal but ignored an intelligence report that may have prevented her death if they had acted on it. The paper also says that security flagged more than 300 suspect workers, but nothing was done. The City Press is reporting about what they say was a failure in crime intelligence that uh, uh, kept police in a vacuum with no clear direction on how to respond to the rising crisis of xenophobic violence in South Africa. The paper says that the police were caught napping when the violence broke out because crime intelligence has been hampered by instability and infighting in the upper echelons of uh, this uh, police unit. The Sunday Independent has two big stories on its front page. Uh, rape and murder victim Uyine Nim Khachana's emotional funeral. And also the paper talks about the efforts being made by Grasa Michelle to stop Madiba's doctor from releasing sensitive information about his last days. Information, the paper says, includes the fact that Madiba died in Winnie Madikizela's, uh, Mandela's arms. In the Sunday Tribune, well, they've gone with the same story that uh, Grasa Michelle is uh, trying to stop Dr. Vijay Ramlakan from releasing details about Madiba's final years and how his uh, physician is appearing before the Professional Conduct Committee over the matter. Uh, the Weekend Argus is also following the same story. Um, here, Grasa Michelle tries to halt Mandela's book. It appears that Michelle called for the conduct committee probe and she wants the people attending that uh, probe meeting to be banned from publishing Madiba's medical and other private information. And as you can guess, whatever you try and hide, people will find and they'll put on social media and that's how it works. Okay, so that's what's in the newspapers, but what's trending on social media? Because that's where most people nowadays, uh, sadly, get all of their news. But let's take a look. And these are the top trends on social media at the moment. Bonnie, uh, Shoma, Josie, Pearl, and the Sacred Space, Sunday Motivations. Four and five are the usual stories. But this, Bonnie Mbuli, uh, having a spat with uh, uh, Shoma Josie. Apparently, Shoma Josie tweeted something. Bonnie Mbuli, of course, then said, what about the fact that these are not your words, suggesting that her tweets are generated by somebody else? Well, as you can imagine, social media is fetching Bonnie Mbuli uh, about this, saying, how dare? So that's the top trend, top news story on social media. Can you believe it? All right, so there's so much to get through on the show this morning and helping us to make sense of these stories. My guest editor, 
well, we say welcome to SABC SAFM executive producer Krivani Pillay, who also uh, produces Democracy Gate, which comes out uh, during the week. And uh, so here she is. Wave to us, Krivani. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so uh, lots to go through, lots to deal with. But uh, the first story. The National Association of Broadcasters has recently released uh, its uh, second report on the state of broadcasting industry in South Africa. The 36-page report focuses on several key issues, which include how listeners access content, moving the TV broadcasting industry forward, radio podcasts and on-demand listening, amongst others. It also looks at how cell phones, vehicle radio, television, TV and computer streaming listening has evolved. Well, to help us unpack this report, we're now joined in studio by Nadia uh, Bolbolia, who's the Executive Director of the National Association of Broadcasters of South Africa. Nadia, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Welcome to thanks. the program. Thanks, Peter. It's lovely to be here. Thanks so All much. Right. So, 25 years on, um, but it's only your second report. So, Ted, yeah. take, take us through the history of yeah. this. Yeah. So, the National Association of Broadcasters is an industry body, mm. and uh, we're happy to say that all the television broadcasters are our members. So, welcome. Um, in you know, 20 years of democracy, when we celebrated that milestone, we thought we'd reflect back um, and look at tracking from 1994 mm. to 2014. So we started the report in 2014, and we surveyed our members, being a membership organization, and we used PwC to do a survey. A very intensive questionnaire was put mm. to our members, and they responded on a very confidential basis, you can imagine. And then we thought, let's look now, you know, moving forward to 25 years of democracy. So we begin to start looking at trends and we begin to start gauging, you know, through these reports right, how far right. we've come. And that's why this year we've done the, um, you know, we've published it this year, but the yeah. results were all, you know, up to 2018, the end of the business uh, year for many people. I mean, it's fascinating, as yeah. you have seen, and thank yeah. you for mentioning that. It's <laughs> 25 years of freedom uh, <laughs> of broadcasting um, that, you know, the airwaves were only open when we had our first independent broadcasting yeah. authority in 1994. Um, and at the time, you know, it was so nascent, the development, for example, of community broadcasting. Yeah. And today we're sitting here with more than 264 community radio stations in the country. And, of course, commercial broadcasting has grown significantly. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I remember 1994, we probably had five five, six television channels. And now they're hundreds, right. literally. And on multi-channel platforms yeah. and with subscription broadcasters, more than six, 260 channels at any given time. Mm. But what we wanted to do in this report as well, Peter, was just to demonstrate the kind of impact and the contributions that yeah. this industry makes to the fiscus, yeah. um, to employee and corporate taxes, uh, to investment in production. Yeah. You would have seen that from 2014 to 2018, 20, uh, 2019. Investment in production went mm. from 4 billion to like 7.5 wow. billion. So I think the investment in local content is certainly something we've got to celebrate um, given the relevance yeah. of content etc and we see that a lot I mean before yeah. again you know I've lived long enough to see the differences yeah. we'd get all these soap operas from overseas yeah. and uh, yeah. just package them put them in yeah. nowadays we've got whole channels uh, just of local content absolutely I'm and that's that's really what you know the yeah. enabling legislative environment was there to do mm. the uh, the regulatory framework really enhanced that really pushed that yeah. you know when we started quotas way back then just for music for example example, there were lots of naysayers, yeah. as you can imagine. Today, they recognize had it not been for those interventionist policies at the time, yeah. we wouldn't have seen this incredible, diverse yeah. you know, landscape that we're living through now. Okay. I'm going to start picking up some of the words that you used in the report. A shifting and dynamic mm. industry. Yeah. Take us to what does yeah. that mean? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you just have yeah. to think about, uh, and we keep having to yeah. flash back to know where we're at, to know yeah. where we're wanting to go. And that's what the report does. It looks inward, it looks forward, mm. and it begins to talk about how this industry is extremely diverse. It is our culture. It is yeah. about promoting our cultural heritage. It's about cons cons constantly shifting where we are as, as a people. Yeah. Um, and if we look at what radio has done, for example, just the kind of growth and expansion, the fact that we have so many different language mm. stations, the fact that we have, you know, great genres now, that people are packaging content that's specific, that's bespoke. Television-wise, and of course we're sitting here, there's so many more channels to choose from. Yeah. This is the point, is that it's always available to you and you can select now what you would like mm. to see. In the past, they were very limited. Um, and I think we need to look at the trends globally. That's where things are shifting as well. Yeah. So how have people been accessing content over time because that's mm. shifted quite a bit I mean mm. I mm. again you know it was either in your car radio yeah. or the radio at home right, but right. it's changed a lot 
of course it's changed, yeah. but it's also not changing as dramatically. Mm. And remember that we have issues of um, access and affordability in our country. So, you know, the whole mm. thing about data must fall and uh, affordable access yeah. to telecommunications. So what we found is people are still listening to radio in their cars. However, there's a shift to people listening to radios on their mobile devices yeah. of streaming, and that's also growing. Um, and But car radios, definitely. Um, when we look at television, it's no longer you kind of linear services. It's yeah. this whole interrelationship. And right now you're talking about social media. Media, what's happened is this, this entire media landscape has converged in so many ways. Yeah. So conversations continue after what you've just seen on a program. Yeah. That's incredible. And that's what keeps pop the population yeah. engaged. And I think that's what's so wonderful about the way things are shifting. Mm. So advertising revenue is another big thing, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wonder how that's tracked over time. Yeah. Um, with all of this, uh, these platforms, increased platforms, mm -hmm. Um, and content. How has advertising revenue grown over time? Yeah. Well, look, it, it has trended upward. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, the, with economic pressures, with the downturn yeah. in the economy, it's still good to see that it's trended upwards. Total revenue, for example, on the radio side grew from 3.8 billion to 4.2 billion, whilst on the television side, that grew from 30 billion mm. to 35.5 billion. I think the, the, the other thing we want to say is the contributions, again, to corporate tax, employee tax, that's also shifted on the radio front from 384 million to 600. Yeah. And of course, on the corporate taxes on the side of, of television from 3.7 billion yeah. to 4.5 billion. Again, I stress, Peter, these were our members that we surveyed. Yeah. Um, there is uh, more than 200 community radio stations, yeah. which, as we know, in this country, we need to find better ways to do good, in-depth yeah. research, to also track those developments and shifts, because those are really community-based. Yeah. They work on volunteer systems as well. And I suppose the digital platforms are shifting that. Um, we're seeing... Uh, the Facebooks and mm. uh, the Googles of this mm. world stealing some of Absolutely. that uh, traditional media. Absolutely. And that's a big concern with, you know, yeah. the traditionally regulated broadcasters. Mm. There's a great call for regulatory parity. There's a great call for looking at how you enable great opportunity for local mm. investment and local production. Uh, it's a global phenomenon. Yeah. We're seeing this, you know, elsewhere. Um, there's a lot of concern around how you regulate and how you regulate in a, in a productive manner, in a meaningful wa way. Also, for example, if we start looking at the issues of concern yeah. across these platforms, issues of protection of children. So there's some universal concerns, and we see this whether we're in the United States, in Europe, in India, wherever we are, we are concerned with how we, we're providing content for children, yeah. how they're accessing it. So there's a great push around media literacy, there's a great push around looking at how we deal with online mm -hmm. content. And so Earlier this year, we also did a little booklet, a toolkit for community broadcasting in particular. That. <laughs> and that's also looking at how the environment's shifted mm -hmm. and how we prepare ourselves for that and how we act responsibly at all times as broadcasters. So uh, you've, you've talked about regulation, and that's mm -hmm. one of the things that mm -hmm. South Africa hasn't done terribly well in. Mm -hmm. Um, we've had so many communications ministers mm -hmm. over the years, mm -hmm. and so legislation has not always moved at the pace that's required. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been extremely challenging, um, and as regulated mm -hmm. industries, and we're not the only one that's regulated yeah. in the country, there are many industries regulated, we always call for policy certainty. Mm -hmm. We always talk for some, some kind of predictability. Remember, people are investing yeah. huge resources yeah. to make this happen. And if there are constant shifts and there is no continuity, that has a huge de detrimental impact, absolutely. Regrettably, we have seen a changeover of ministers sometimes almost you know, every year. Mm -hmm. um, we are looking forward to the certainty that uh, the, the president has managed to put together now, the new department. Um, it's, it's going to be, mm -hmm. it has been renamed, as you know. And we're looking to see for some stability. Yeah. Uh, we're encouraged to note that um, the minister has indicated there'll be an audiovisual policy review process. That's been in discussion mm. for almost five years or four years. So as regulated industries, it's about how do we plan for the future, yeah. especially in an economy that is so challenging as what we're facing now. Think about what this does mm. to employment to jobs, yeah. to joblessness, etc. So, you know, you're right. And that is something that we've been appealing to, again, as many other yeah. regulated industries have done. Again, we'll stay in the regulation space because now the local broadcasters are regulated. They have to follow certain mm -hmm. rules. But then enter Netflix stage right and uh, right, other right, uh, right. online platforms. Right, right. Uh, how do you level the playing field in an environment like and this? You sound like you'd be a great <laughs> ambassador for us. Thank you, Peter. This is the point is yeah. that um, we've been concerned about 
kind of what their contributions are to the fiscus, to mm. taxes, to jobs, to local content investment. This is the point about regulatory parity. And if we're saying we want to open up and we want, if we do live in this global you know, space, is what concessions need to be made? Mm. What needs to happen to these you know, broadcasters who have traditionally been extremely heavily regulated? Yeah. How do we begin to look at a framework that is less restrictive? Um, on the radio front, for example, many of our broadcasters have said it's been extremely difficult to even collaborate mm -hmm. at times. So do we have to start looking at some flexibility built in? But at the same time, I think these are issues that the Department of Trade and Industry needs to weigh in on as well. Yeah. Uh, we just see what's happening globally around the kinds of fines that are being issued. But these are multinationals. And what's the impact in terms of our domestic content, in terms of our own development mm -hmm. of, of unique content that's ours, that we should be proud about uh, in the face of this kind of rising internationalism? Mm -hmm. And let's face this, Peter, this rising internationalism has got to do with language. People can access English-based content. What's happening to the incredible diverse African language spread that we have in this country? How do we start mm. pushing that forward? Where are the unique genres and content streams in languages other than English? Yeah. And I think that's what we need to be concentrating on. So when Netflix next packages, etc., how much content is there that all our people can mm. access, which is, of course, affordable and available? So for IR, we're in the midst of it. Mm. Some people mm. think it's a future yeah. event, but I think we're right in the middle of it. Yeah. How are your broadcasters, yeah. your members, yeah. um, converting and right. uh, working in this environment? Right. I mean, I think it's a nat natural progression. Yeah. Technology has been with us, will continue to be with us. This is natural next steps, etc. Mm. I think this whole integration of humanity and the robotics and mm. issues that people are quite alarmed and afraid of. The reality is we live, we're living with technology all the time. I'm just looking at the studio and all the technology that yeah. keeps improving and changing and is meant to become more efficient and, uh, and low cost. So broadcasters, of course, in the creative field have been, you just have to think about the green screens, you just have to think about yeah. everything that's now CG, etc. Um, so in terms of those trends from a technology front, absolutely. What I always say is, think about you listening to radio. Would you just want things to be on automation? Or do you want that personal interaction with a yeah. human being? And we storytellers at the end of the day. I don't think that machine storytelling is going to be yeah. quite it. Well, I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think it's, it's there, <coughs> something we're embracing. It's we're working, ag again, across all spheres, within every department of government. People are concerned with what uh, automation mm. will do. And how, you know, the benefits, you just look at the incredible outcomes with this kind of technology. Yeah. And I think we don't, we're not afraid we're embracing it, but at the same time, we're needing to caution and we're needing to say, how do we fix the basics? We talk about basic access for mm. all our children in schools. Do all our children have basic access? And now we talk about, you know, iPads, um, safety and security around that. And more importantly, what are the content layers? What is it that people mm. are consuming as well? We're concerned about that. We're concerned about constantly looking at South mm. Africa and what is, what is our South Africanness throughout you know, these yeah. platforms, the way things are evolving, etc. And of course, you're constantly competing with these, the rise of YouTube channels mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. can just spring up from nowhere. Yeah. 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 And people are accessing stuff wherever they can access. They gravitate. Yeah. I have two young teenage daughters. I, I don't think they watch traditional television yeah. in the sense and the way that we did when we grew up. So the sense of the national identity and national cohesion, yeah. etc. Just with the younger generation, there's so many disruptors, you know, influencers, mm. etc., etc. So th they're working in a different space because there's so much available to them. But I think what we're finding, and this is again where research and data really helps when we're developing policy, is what is the data showing us? How are people monetizing this? Mm. Um, how are people actually creating good, viable, sustainable businesses out of this? Um, is it kind of something mm. we're just enjoying for the time? What's the next big thing? And I think globally they're also tracking this. Yeah. But you're right, the biggest competitor, certainly in the audiovisual space, yeah. is you know YouTube. Absolutely. So our broadcasters, digital switchovers uh, yeah. scheduled for 2020. Are yeah. we going to make it? And are our broadcasters you know, Pete, it's ready? It's it's this, as you know, has been a hugely uh, contested, very complex yeah. uh, space. Certainly something the NAB's members, as all the broadcasters, have been working very closely with for for a very long time, mm -hmm. as you can imagine. Um, we we remain hopeful. I think that there are huge opportunities that we're going to be missing if we don't meet these deadlines. But again, it's complex um, and, and we're looking forward to how that, that does eventually get realized. Um, and mm. when we think about kind of just 
you look into the future, yeah. I think we need to look at that spectrum migration. Broadcasters still have to go off the 700, yeah. 800, the process for that, the time, the resources, the costs. Yeah. Um, and there's some real considerations, which as you know, government and, and the sector has been grappling with for some time. All right, we're going to be chatting to Krivani Pillay shortly, who, who does a program called Democracy Gage. Mm -hmm. In conclusion, do you think that our broadcasters have served our democracy in the 25 years? Oh, absolutely. And I think we continue to serve the democracy just absolutely beautifully. If you look at the kinds of content that's coming out, if you look at the fact that broadcasters are very compliant, they you know, comply with the code of conduct for broadcasters, they adhere to their license requirements and conditions, they do innovative content, there are so many opportunities in different languages yeah. and I keep having to stress that because that is what we're about, the dynamism, the, vi the vibrancy and I think it will continue to grow. However, it does need to be in that enabling environment for it to flourish because uh, we want to sustain South African broadcasting. Nadia, thank you so much for joining us and Thanks, uh, sharing Peter. your thoughts with us. And uh, people can access this on report our website, on your absolutely, website. Absolutely, nab.org.za. Thank you. Fantastic, Nadia. Pleasure Thanks. talking to you. Lovely. All right, we are going to uh, pause for a minute and then when we come back, uh, we'll continue. I'm going to ask um, Krivani actually about uh, the democracy 25 years on in the media, plus also fake news that's doing the rounds at the moment at critical times. Okay, stop. Cut. Times have changed, and you deserve a juice that's 100% fruit. No added sugar, no preservatives. Because in a world filled with fake, nothing's more precious than real. We stay on the visuals, they're busy shooting. In, uh, we drove around this. Welcome back, you're still watching Media Monitor. Now, social media users, the public has been warned to be careful about fake messaging doing the rounds to intimidate and create fear. Well, this comes after a series of videos and pictures that have been circulating online depicting attacks on foreign nationals in this past week. A Negureleni Metro police officer who shared a misleading message calling for parents to urgently fetch their children at schools has been suspended. Let's hear from the Gauteng MEC for Education. This misinformation is now uh, targeting our schools. We received information that uh, people were targeting our schools purely because they felt that uh, there are revenge attacks uh, directed at, our, at, at school children and therefore parents panicked and came to collect their children. We also received information that this school is on fire and that's the reason why we came here running, only to find that the school is not on fire, the school is in order and everything is in order. We also received information that um, there are people that are intending to kidnap uh, our children in revenge of what is happening outside our school premises. We want to assure parents uh, that together with law enforcement agencies, we had contacts with the crime intelligence. Uh, they've, they've indeed classified that information as false, and therefore parents must not panic. All right, so let's chat with my guest editor today, Krivani. We talk about it all the time, um, but what saddens me actually is that people who n should know better are retweeting things and passing it through as if it's actually true. Absolutely, Peter. And as if the, the, the issue we're dealing with is yeah. not difficult enough and not serious enough, mm. and then you have the authorities and the media industry trying to filter out which in fact is the truth from, from the mischievous um, uh, nature of retweeting. And we live in an information mm. age, and we've, uh, it makes it quite difficult now for, for, for us in the media 
because not only do we have to verify, do the normal verification processes of our own story of if we had to look at the xenophobic attacks just yeah. in its entirety and what we're supposed to do, now comes the added burden of having to verify the information filtering through social media. Yeah. And with being in a deadline-driven environment, it, it, it is such a pressure on journalists today to have to verify, mm. break the story, do it timelessly, mm. provide this, this kind of information. Yeah. Do you think that we do a good enough job though? Because I do think sometimes we drop the ball with these things. And if it was tweeted by Krivani, I assume it must be true. Absolutely. Isn't it? So <laughs> it, it's, it's such a fine line, Peter, yeah. because... For example, if you, if you know a reputable journalist mm. or an authority figure or a captain of industry or even a, a politician for that mm. matter, you, you tr you, you, there's a sense of an con unspoken contract of trust yeah. that you've developed with that personality. So if you know of a leading investigative journalist that retweets uh, a, a post, you, you are likened to believe that. Yeah. Is it your job as the person who's consuming that information? to then go and verify mm -hmm. or is it the person that is taking the responsibility of retweeting yeah. we underestimate what retweeting yeah. actually means in the social media I mean, environment this past week i saw an image of a, a, a video of a woman being beaten up by men and it looked like in the context of what we we're ta to talking about xenophobic violence mm. but this thing happened in the drc a few years ago and put in the midst of what was happening in South Africa, it starts to create the story that this happened here, yes. and this is what's happening to people here, and I, 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 people don't seem to understand that it could have deathly consequences. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Mm. Africa Check, Peter, did something very important mm. this week, and it was important for all of us. They decided to go and look at the details and the history of some of the videos that mm. were posted. And they, um, th they found that some of the, the videos posted weren't even happening in South Africa. Yeah. It was in India and other parts of the mm. continent. They found that some of the videos that were posted weren't even of the past week. They were of two years ago. Mm. And it was important that they did what they did. And we in the media, so you and myself and other editors, particularly in the, at the SABC, we started to retweet that yeah. on our social media platforms in an attempt to educate our mm. audiences that hang on, before you do this, please note that actually um, this is further, uh, these yeah. false videos are further exacerbating mm. the situation. And it's a very dangerous situation that we find ourselves in. We've got people's lives at risk. Yeah. With whether you are South African or not, you are putting lives at risk by tweeting, mm. retweeting, and posting uh, incorrect information. But doesn't that make the burden much more for the uh, broadcasters, the media houses? It's because now we've got education as part of our work instead of just reporting the stories. Absolutely, Peter. You know, I sing the song all the time. Yeah. <laughs> our newsrooms are, so, and this is not just the SABC, mm. this is an industry-wide problem. With financial pressures, newsrooms are getting smaller. Mm. It means that fewer journalists have to do far more. Um, it means that budgets are cut. It means that we no longer have the luxury of spending a day or two on a story where you can verify, where you can have a plurality of voices. We now have a, f a journalist working on a few stories a day, having a few deadlines a day. So what happens? Some of the verification falls by the mm. wayside. You know, and that's where when, 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 a, when a video is posted on, on uh, a Twitter or any yeah. social media platform, it takes that much more time yeah. to verify the source and to find out where it first originated from. And I suppose, you know, we talk about this perennial thing of, uh, I think it was termed the juniorization of the yes. newsroom. Because it does take a bit of experience and, a, and a, an eye that's seen a lot of things. Absolutely. You can tell. I mean, like I saw that video. I, said, I just I knew it was not South Africa. 
because you are someone with institutional <laughs> memory. Because, because you've, you know, you've Without just... Without giving they're away clues. your age. And one of the things was a simple thing. A guy was wearing a T-shirt and it had French writing. And you don't see that often in South Africa. So that already says, okay, could this be fake? And do the steps. But if you're young and you just see this and it's trending, mm. you just do it. And uh, Sorry, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Yeah. But one of the other things we don't lean a lot on in newsrooms, and again, across mm. industry-wide, is institutional memory. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I'm not trying to um, trivialize what our junior reporters are doing, mm. but there's a lack of research. There's a lack of reading. Um, I remember a, a former co-host of mine, Kolani Gwala, mm. Um, uh, he was very he was very much more senior than I was yeah. when when we were, were working together and I, and I looked at him and I said how do you do this how do you recall mm. these things often when you were still at school and he said I read I don't only read the newspapers I read autobiographies yeah. I read uh, non-fiction you've got to be reading the history books mm. and and that's what gives the nuanced approach to your stories and your storytelling so what do we do? Um, next week, some story is going to come out and there will be more fake news. What do we do? I think the powers that be need to realize that while social media is giving us journalists a run for our money, you cannot trivialize mm. the power of the media yeah. and you cannot trivialize the power of the newsroom. So, for example, now I talk about the SABC mm. in that we all know th the financial pressures that are facing us as an organization, but we cannot uh, reduce what our newsroom is used to doing. In fact, mm -hmm. with the advent of social media, we've well. got to be expanding and we've got to do a lot more. And, and that's why the importance of saving our organization and in particular our newsroom. All right. I mean, this is something we can talk about uh, for uh, ages and uh, sadly, someone that we have to keep on revisiting uh, because it is such a problem. Uh, but that's where we're going to leave this particular discussion for the time being because there's lots to talk about, uh, especially your appearance at the Zondo Commission. I'd like to know more about that. <laughs> so stay with us. Uh, you're watching Media Monitor and uh, we'll have a little bit more for you right after this. I'm trying to get the most out of my day, trying to get this workout in and film this infomercial. And I'm sure you're trying to get the most out of life too. So, what's stopping you? What? Money? Money shouldn't stop you from going on holiday, paying emergency car repairs, or buying that gym equipment that you've always wanted. Get it sorted with a U-Bank personal loan of up to 100,000 Rand with flexible repayment terms of up to 60 months. So you can focus on dreaming big and reaching your goals and U-Bank can help you sort out your finances. <sighs> Get it sorted with a U-Bank loan. <sighs> I've reached my calorie count and finished filming this infomercial. <sighs> Hashtag Get it sorted! Ah, you bank, growing with you. Drop it. All right, welcome back. You're watching Media Monitor. So we were talking about fake news just before the break. I just want to get a quick comment uh, from somebody who uh, watches media quite a bit, and that's uh, uh, William Bird from uh, uh, Media Watch. Thank you so much uh, indeed, uh, William, for joining us. Uh, welcome to the program. Very quick comment on fake news that was playing out during the course of these um, uh, xenophobic attacks on uh, uh, shops owned by foreign nationals. You are watching the media all the time and what are your thoughts uh, based on what we've seen? Hi, good morning. So look, I think that when, when we talk about mis and disinformation and people that deliberately spread information to heighten uh, and, and cause and instill panic and fear, as it would appear some of those 
uh, efforts were. You know, I think telling parents that their school is being attacked is something like that. That's incitement, you know, and that's um, very dangerous. It's not just something that, uh, you know, you spread to spread a malicious rumor about a celebrity or something. These things can have very real life consequences. And I hope that in addition to just being suspended, that that person responsible actually faces the full might of the law. You know, they need to be, um, you know, they need that at, at the very minimum, they need to be fired. And I would suggest that they probably need to look at something even more significant than that, you know, because it's, people need to understand that has very real consequences. Uh, we're seeing this time and again, you know, the latest court ruling uh, against our former president, uh, you know, so someone even as, as, as powerful as him, you can't just say whatever you think you want to say on social media and think that everything's okay, you know, it's, which is the same as it is in the real world. It's just that people need to start realizing that the real world mirrors the digital world as well. All right, so how do we compete with stuff that's just floating around in social media by non-journalists that people are relying on? Um, we can only do so much as traditional mainstream media. Yeah, that's the thing, you know, but it's also why, as Krivani pointed out, that that's why the role of media nowadays is even more critically important, precisely because people need someone or a source that they can trust and get credible information from, and that needs to be fundamentally in South Africa, the public broadcaster for one, and it needs to be the range of other credible media as well. People need to know that if they go there, they can do it, which means that your job, one of the critical roles that, that journalists should always play is making sure that they put out information that is accurate and balanced and fair. All right, so William, we're going to leave it there. Thanks so much Thank indeed uh, for your brief comments. That's William Bird from Media Monitoring Africa, who is the uh, director there. Fake news, big, big, big problem. All right, so uh, it's time now for us to connect with our international uh, editor feature. And today we go to Zimbabwe, uh, just two days after the passing of former President Robert Mugabe. And to take us uh, through how the story is being told, we're now joined uh, by SABC correspondent Effort Musekiwa. Effort, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Welcome to the program. And as we say in our language, Nematamvudzigo. Uh, as we say again in our language, <laughs> our Good morning, well, Peter. All right. So um, he's such a complex character, was such a complex character. I can only imagine that it's diff you'll have different versions of the story when you still tell the story of Robert Mugabe. Yes, indeed. Uh, you know, we've spoken to many people. Um, I think uh, one of the best pictures I've seen was in today's uh, state newspaper, the Sunday Mail, where there are so many faces of Robert Mugabe. And indeed, it tells the true story of the man. He was indeed a man of many faces. Um, some describe him as a father, others describe him uh, you know, as a villain, others describe him as a dictator, others describe him as a humble man. The stories never end. And up to this day, two days down the line, people are still talking about their experiences, people are still telling us how they encountered former President Robert Mugabe and how he has uh, touched or changed their lives. So really, the story is different. It depends on who you're speaking to. They will tell you a new story. They will tell you a different story from the other person. All right, so let's talk about the media, because there's normally a divide between state-owned media and private media uh, in the country. What line have they taken generally about uh, his passing? Well, I'll start with the uh, uh, state media, as like I indicated, uh, in their front page, they lead with the headline, uh, celebrating the life of an icon. And below it, um, you will find the many faces uh, that, uh, uh, you know, of Robert Mugabe from his childhood to his later days. Um, they are talking about, they are just telling us, you know, his history, how he managed to lead the liberation struggle, how he, you know, uh, lived his life even as the president, as the leader of uh, liberated Zimbabwe, uh, what he stood for, what he fought for. And, uh, you know, they are also touching a bit about his later uh, days uh, um, uh, as the leader of, the, of, of a free Zimbabwe. Uh, 
also talking about you know uh, preparations for his uh, funeral uh, that uh, they have indicated that we're expecting the body to to arrive on Wednesday and some of the uh, arrangements that have been put in place where they expect that the nation will be given a chance to mourn the icon at the, at the uh, giant national stadium they also indicate that they expect that uh, when his body arrives it will be taken to his rural home uh, in Zimba, where the, most of the activities are going to be centered around. Now, moving on to the private media, which is uh, uh, the standard, they also lead with uh, uh, the, the headline Mugabe uh, Family Breathes Fire. This is uh, a story that uh, they are running with the story that members of Mugabe family were not allowed to visit uh, the president, uh, uh, especially towards the end of, the, of his life. They were not able to travel and visit their relative in Singapore because some of them, like the former mines minister and one of his uh, nephews, they are, they, they, they are facing um, corruption uh, charges and their passports have been confiscated by the state uh, because they are on bail. So they were not able to travel and meet uh, the, uh, or to travel and see their uh, former president, Robert Mugabe. And they are saying that the family has actually barred some members of the ruling ZANU-PF party from attending the funeral or from attending the, the proceedings. And they have highlighted that uh, they have taken a different stance where they are talking about the immediate of what's going on between the family and the ZANU-PF party, a party which uh, the former president ruled uh, for almost 40 years of his life. He was at the helm of this party and they have been been uh, major tensions between him and the party towards the end of his life. All right. It's always quite difficult. I, I remember when um, Nelson Mandela passed, there was a sense of mourning that was quite palpable right across the country. Is that the sense you're getting in Zimbabwe? Um, again, you know, he was different things to different people. What Can you feel the loss or is it mixed? Well, it's uh, it's a bit it's been a bit mixed, Peter. In that, uh, you know, uh, as Africans, we don't celebrate death. Even the opposition did highlight that we don't celebrate death. We should actually uh, live or should celebrate the good or the life that uh, he has lived. But a lot of people, uh, because of the suffering that uh, Zimbabwe is currently facing, a lot of the economic hardships, a lot of people attribute these uh, hardships to the former president, uh, Robert Mugabe's policies. And in as much as they appreciate the good things that he has done, a lot of, I think a lot of the grief has been taken away by that mere fact that a lot of people are actually uh, in, uh, are suffering and has taken away their sense of grief, um, the, the major part of it, that in as much as you, when you speak to them, they do say that we don't celebrate death but they are not really in a state of mourning. I've, I've encountered quite a number of people that say, you know, it's part of life, he's gone, but it's very difficult for me to actually mourn him at this point because I am in a situation where everywhere I look, the situation I look around me, I attribute it to him in as much as I loved him or in as much as I respected him in the early years, but uh, right now, currently, I am suffering because of uh, some of his policies. All right, effort. That's where we'll leave it. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, always great to talk to you as usual. That's uh, effort Msekiwa, who's our correspondent uh, in Zimbabwe. Uh, coming back home, Krivani, this is a story that, uh, you know, Friday it broke and I could see the media grappling with how to deal with this because depending on the guest that was sitting in front of you, you got a completely different version. And I was also intrigued by some of the headlines some of the broadcasters chose. Some would say tyrant, dictator. Others would say, you know, nation icon. in mourning, icon. Legend. So even here in South Africa, we, we kind of struggled uh, collectively as a, as, a, as a broadcasting and uh, media community to tell the story. Absolutely. And you know what our rule number one would be mm. is history. Right. What happened in history will guide our reportage, you know. And what you just said now, he means different things to different people. Mm. Uh, his policies have certainly helped some people and his po policies have hurt some people. I remember in a politics class of mine, um, uh, Professor Roda Julu, the, the late Professor Julu, um, he was uh, teaching us about Robert Mugabe and he told us about the once breadbasket of Zimbabwe. But I was a student around the time that things were turning in Zimbabwe and I couldn't figure out for the life of me 
how this person who would bring democracy and independence to this country would then start to take contribute to this direction. Absolutely. Mm. So we need to be truthful at all ends from a media perspective. Mm. The public, the people of Zimbabwe, the people of the world, even the Queen yeah. will remember him. The Queen of England will remember him differently. I mean, she at one point, I think, stripped a title. Yeah, uh, his uh, honorary knighthood. Absolutely. Was um, so, mm. so, so, if we look at history honestly and truthfully, that mm. should be how we guide um, our our reporting and our factual mm. content. It is a difficult one. You know, Absolutely. we're not one thing, sadly, over time. But, you know, he's accused of really atrocious things. But at the same time, he also contributed to the liberation of the country. So, uh, what the do liberation you do? of our uh, country yes. as well. Yeah. yeah. So how do you tell that story? Do you say that he was both or do you pick a side, as, as some people have? You know, you've got to, for me, the easiest way yeah. of telling the story of Robert Mugabe would be in a chronological manner. Right, right. If you do it in a chronological manner, you will then be able to even show how the man had changed. What were the changing points of his leadership, of his times in power, of his relationship with not only his people, but his relationship with the continent and, for example, the Commonwealth. You know, yeah. and that would be the only way yeah. to report on Robert Mugabe. Okay, just stick to the facts, historical, and then let people make up their own Absolutely. mind. Absolutely. Kravani, we're going to continue discussing issues in a short while, but first, it's uh, time now for one of my favorite slots on the program, and that's where we dig into the SABC News Archives for a, a story from yesteryear. And today we travel back to 1998, and this was the lead story about uh, Neighbors Lesotho. The Lesotho Congress for Democracy Party has conceded that irregularities existed during the recent elections in the country. However, Deputy Prime Minister Gelabona Maope said his government believed there was no fraud. The change of heart comes on the eve of the release of the much-awaited Langer Commission report into the validity of election results. Deputy President Thabo Mbeki and representatives from the Botswana and Zimbabwean governments are expected in Maseru tomorrow. Six weeks ago, Lesotho's opposition party staged a protest march to the King's Palace with allegations that the May general election's results were rigged. The parties appealed to King Lithia III to dissolve Parliament and call new elections. The crisis deepened and Sadek intervened. Last month, the Langa Commission was set up. Today, Maupe blamed the inexperienced Independent Electoral Commission for the crisis. The IEC is the institution which is running the election. So if we are laying blame at all, it must be where it belongs. It belongs to the IEC. With no end inside to the Lesotho crisis, it is understood that the Langa report will find that the election results were rigged. It is also believed that Lesotho's foreign minister visited Harare to seek advice. All right, so that was 1998, and uh, it's sad that such a small country that you can fast forward to 2019 and again in the headlines around uh, ruling party and uh, leadership issues. Let's hope that uh, things can settle there. But listen, if you want us to go back to a particular year, uh, we'll dig up our archives because uh, we have news that nobody else has, else has access to, and we'd love to share it with you. Uh, drop us a note, uh, hashtag SABC Media Monitor. All right, we take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll start like, taking a look at today's newspapers here in South Africa. What should you do to avoid getting ill? Eat healthy, not to do drugs, not to smoke. To learn more about some of the most common illnesses and how to avoid them, join Dr. Sidlomo Daung each week and get all your health questions answered by experts. What are those signs that people should look out for and say, this is time for me to go and seek help? It is very important to identify and address those problems as early as possible. You are a fighter, you are a warrior, and you will get better. Right here on Health Talk. 
What prompted this whole conversation? He immediately said he will not be renewing the contract next year when it comes to an end in April. They say it's over 10 years that uh, they've been getting a raw deal from the bus company. 1,800 people that work for that company are all of a sudden jobless. The solution we're providing is to basically take those buses off the road. Innovations to the home of a world-renowned traditional healer, Credo Mutwa, are expected to be completed this after a social media frenzy about the unbearable conditions that Mutwa and his family are subjected to. After discussions with the infrastructure unit, they have indicated by the end of the month, everything should be finalized. Hasina Gori, what's happening where you are? Where community members of Flockfontein in the south of Johannesburg has come out to say enough is enough. Tokazani Sebeko is allegedly guilty of murdering his 41-year-old lover. They were sick and tired of men killing women in our area. Right, welcome back. Uh, let's take a look at uh, what's happening in the papers. But what I do want to start with uh, is uh, something a little bit different. And uh, Krivani, you were at the Zondo Commission and you testified there. And I saw uh, Tandega Kobule, who said that she felt it was quite cathartic for her to have gone there because it was an opportunity to tell the story. Mm -hmm. At the time that you were the SABC 8 and, and uh, going through the, what you went through and telling, trying to communicate the story, it was falling on deaf ears. Mm. How was your experience of the Zondo Commission? Um, I think uh, Tandeko was right. Mm. It was, there was a sense of uh, catharsis that went with mm. that uh, process. I was hoping that when we appeared in Parliament uh, two and a half years ago, that that would be the end yeah. of it. Unfortunately, it wasn't. Um, and for me, Peter, from a physical, spiritual, and emotional space, uh, it was really my closure yeah. having appeared at the Zondo Commission. Um, and a, a, a lot of people asked me, how did you feel? And, and I, f I had a massive migraine afterwards. Wow. It, it, it was... It was, it was quite bizarre yeah. yeah all right so unfortunately at the end of it um, judge justice uh, deputy chief justice zondo uh, had a go at the media yes. and saying that uh, we don't always do what's in the best interest let's take a listen i have on a few occasions complained that uh, uh, journalists and media houses are very much in the habit of giving people about whom they have stories to write very inadequate time to respond, very short notice. We here in the Commission have been subjected to the same thing. And it looks like whatever appeal I make to the media to say, not just us, everybody, please, just give people adequate time to put their side of the story. It looks like they say, ah, we don't care about that. All right, so we don't care. That's mm -hmm. what the Deputy Chief Justice says. How is it that our deadlines become the deadlines of the people who are the target of the story? Absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's really difficult, mm. uh, Peter, because this is what the public broadcaster is all about. It's, it's supposed to be, and, and we've been doing this, mm. we've been broadcasting from, from the inquiry, but the media also puts a lot of added pressure mm. on, um, on, 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 on people like the commission. For example, the, we the weekend yeah. newspapers, if your deadline is a Friday or a Saturday, your deadline is not his yeah. deadline. Yeah. You know, he should be given, and the witnesses should be given the space in which to respond. Because they need to consider things. Absolutely. So culture needs to change. But very quickly, looking at the papers, let me put up the Sunday Times, because uh, that really tells uh, an interesting story for me. Um, Uyinene. Mm. Eight people are killed every single day. Women are killed every day in South Africa. What was it about this young woman that managed to grab the story and the deadlines? This is, this is it's such an important question mm. that you've asked. 
because a couple of years ago, do you remember one Anine Boyson? Yes, yes. It was the, the manner in which her death and the way she was killed that g g got our attention. Uinene is the same, but you say eight other people, but mm. why does the president go to her funeral yeah. and perhaps not the, of, of the other seven mm. per day? I don't know what it is, Peter. Is it because uh, politicians and people respond because of what's happening in the public space? Because mm. the public is cross. So we need to be seen to be um, supporting that loss and that frustration. I, I, I wish I could understand mm. why we react for some deaths and another. Do you know a heartbreaking tweet for me this week yeah. was a sister who said, my sister was, was uh, missing. But because she was not good looking mm. and she was not mm. at a um, so-called privileged institution, nobody looked yeah. for her. And when I read that tweet, it really yeah. gave me another perspective to because this. Because that can become the narrative when Absolutely. you say you've left me out. I suspect, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think social media has hijacked the news agenda. And... Uyinene's uh, friends were very active. They worked very hard to try and find their friend. And they used social media powerfully. And as a result, it became mm. a story. Whereas the others, perhaps, they don't know how to use social media. And they got left behind. What about the young women in the rural areas exactly. that are abused, exactly. that are missing, exactly. that have been murdered and have no access to social media? Who attends their funerals? Who broadcasts their mm. funerals? And, mm. and, and who gives it the dignity that their life deserves? So how do we get it right as the media houses? Do we actually say, forget what social media is doing? We're going to try and be as fair and as balanced to all victims, or do we just climb on the bandwagon. Remember, some mm. newspapers and some online platforms also need to make money from, their, mm. from what they're delivering. Right. So if you garner the support of the people that need to consume on the platforms that you're delivering on, surely then the narrative mm. will then be to fit what the people want to hear. Right. Um, I believe that the news sets the agenda if you want to set the agenda yeah. you have an overall view of the public that yeah. you're serving yeah okay all right so uh, perhaps finally uh, one story that's uh, doing the rounds quite a bit is uh, I, I can't remember which paper it was um grasa michelle trying to block yes. uh, the release of private and confidential information and you know with this kind of thing once you try and block I remember when the book came out, it was sold out within five minutes. It's going to leak, isn't it? It's going to leak. Mm. Um, I, I know that the, the, the books that weren't sold, mm. I think they tried to destroy yeah. it. Correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. But the moment you, 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 you try and hold on to information yeah. and try to protect something, as an icon as Madiba mm. was, people are, their curiosity yeah. is going they to get the better themselves. of them. Yes. Kravani, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed and, this uh, morning with you. We look forward to the next <laughs> episode of Democracy Again. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you at home, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Uh, please join us again next week at the same time for more of the same uh, Media Monitor. Have a great week in between. Bye-bye, everyone.